painting mistakes to avoid. Today we're going to look at some of the pitfalls involved with using reference photos. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as drawing tutorials, mixed media, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you'll get notified every time I have a new video for you. Make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So let's talk about working from photographs. So a lot of people will try and guilt you about this and say that you shouldn't be doing it. I actually love working from photographs. Of course, I love working from real life as well. There's nothing like it. You know, I love if I've got a real bunch of flowers, I love working from that. Sometimes I'll paint in my garden, but the truth is here in the UK, the weather is just not great for painting outdoors a lot of the time, unless you're very hardy indeed. And I'm not, I feel the cold a lot. I have that thing, is it Raynard's, where your fingers just go numb? You know, the rest of you can be perfectly warm and you're looking at these sort of white fingers wondering how to make them work again. It's just not practical for me to paint outdoors a lot of the time. And I know that for some of you, it's not practical either. So today we're gonna to go through uh, some mistakes that you can make when painting from photographs. So I totally endorse working from photographs if you want to but there are some pitfalls to it and we're gonna go through some of those today. So let's start with mistake number one. So the first mistake is seeing a photograph as absolute reality and absolutely inviolable. I mean, you hear people say, don't you, the camera never lies. Well, I'm afraid it does. I mean, you know, ignoring things like Photoshop and, you know, the way that a human being interacts with a photograph and interprets it differently. We've all seen those reports of, um, you know, people that thought they photographed UFOs or ghosts and it just turned out to be, you know, a rubbish bag floating in the sky or something. So photographs don't always show things exactly as they are. They can be deceptive. They can warp and change perspective. The lenses can do certain things. They can certainly change the color. Photography is an art in its own right and a good photographer will uh, adjust certain settings and make the, uh, the photograph look the way that they want it to. And then many photographs that you might see in books and magazines are indeed altered with Photoshop. So I want you to look at the photograph as a starting point and not consider that everything that you see in it is exactly realistic because they actually can distort and change quite a lot of what you're looking at. So the next mistake is not printing your photograph out before you start working from it. So this one drives me crazy, walking around art classes and looking at people trying to work from a photograph they've got on a phone screen, or you know, even it may be an iPad, Every 30 seconds, the screensaver cuts in. It's absolutely ridiculous. You can't possibly see what you're doing when you're working from a device screen. Don't want any excuses. Maybe you don't have a printer. I'm sure you know someone that does have a printer, or perhaps you have some kind of copy shop or printers locally that could print these things out for you. Um, if you don't have a printer yourself, I would suggest that you get sort of a bit organized and sort yourself out, maybe half a dozen photographs that you think you really want to, uh, to paint from, and then find a way of getting those photographs printed nice and large so that you can work from them. Don't be working from devices or phone screens. It's completely ridiculous and you're never going to get a good result. So the next mistake I see a lot is people, uh, particularly working from commissions, trying to work from photographs that are too small and too blurred. Now, as a professional artist, I can tell you that before I agree to take on a commission, and I take on very few because it's not really my sphere of work, but um, before I agree to take on a commission, I ensure that I have a clear, large photograph that really, really shows a lot of detail. And if the person commissioning me cannot provide this, and this happens quite a lot with dogs, have you ever been asked to paint your friend's dog and they give you this photograph, it's, it's, you know, it's this big and it's black and white and it's pixelated and, uh, oh, please paint Fido, he was such a beautiful dog, I'd love you to capture his personality. You're thinking personality, I can barely see his eyes. Just don't do it. Don't get yourselves into these, uh, these difficult situations. You can only be as good as the source material you're working from. So please don't paint from photographs that are tiny, that are pixelated, that just don't have enough detail particularly when it comes to people and animals. You might get away with it for a loose landscape without a lot of detail in, but please don't try and paint portraits of any people or animals from a small or black and white or pixelated photograph. Of course, it's okay to work from black and white if you're working in monochrome, that's okay. Please make sure you have a good photograph and print it out large. I would say the minimum size would be something that fits edge to edge on A4, that would be uh, American letter size. You don't want to go much smaller than that. 
at this point in the video. Can I ask you, as always, please to click that like button, click that thumbs up. Now about 70% of you who watch me here on YouTube aren't subscribed. Subscribing is free and it really helps my channel. So I do encourage you to like, subscribe, share, or leave me a comment. It helps my channel to grow. I can reach more people and teach more people how to paint and draw. The next mistake I see is uh, working from a photograph of someone else's paintings. You know, I often see students come into class and they'll bring in something like a calendar and there'll be a painting on there, often quite a loose painting, and they'll say, well, I want to do this painting, Michelle. I really don't advise it. Now, there are times when you might want to copy a uh, famous artist's work just to learn about how they made that. I've certainly done that in some of my classes. We've copied some Van Gogh paintings or something like that. But generally speaking, you don't want to be working from someone else's painting, particularly not a painting that's been done in a very loose style. Because what that artist has done is they have excluded a load of information that was in front of them in the, uh, the image they were looking at or the photograph they were working from. They've excluded a whole load of information, a whole load of colours, and they've made certain decisions about how that painting should look. You now don't have those avenues. You can't see that original source material. So unless you have a specific reason for copying one of the classics, I would advise you not to work by making copies of other artists' work. It usually ends up to be a pale imitation and you're just going to be a little bit disappointed. The next mistake, and I'm going to point the camera downwards for this one and give you a little bit of a demonstration. The next mistake is scaling up badly. And this can happen when perhaps you have a, a landscape shaped piece of paper and you've got a square photograph and you find yourself saying, well, you know, the horizon's halfway up and that tree's, you know, about two thirds of the way across. What will happen is if you're not working on the exact same proportions, size doesn't matter, but the exact same proportions, what you're going to do is you're going to stretch or shrink or warp your image. So I'm going to show you now a really simple trick for scaling up a photograph and getting the size exactly right. Let me show you how it's done. So do bear in mind here that um, you'll see this at a slight angle because um, the camera is at a slight angle. But I've got this piece of paper here and here I've got a photograph to work from. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, you know, can't I just do the, uh, the, the photograph? You know, it might be one shape. Can't I just sort of you know, make it into a different shape on the paper? Well, of course you can. If you're very good at perspective, you can do that. Certainly for something like a landscape, you know, if it's just a matter of adding a bit more sky or you know, chopping off the edges, it's gonna be quite easy to adjust that. But if you've got something like this with this complex perspective, this building going on here, it's really gonna be quite hard to do that. So what you want to do is you want to scale up. So the first thing you want to do is decide you know, which way it would fit best in your picture. You can do this for square, portrait, landscape, it works all the same. But this one here, I think it will, um, you know, I could scale it up from here, but it wouldn't be very large. It would work better actually to turn my paper around because this paper is um, landscape shaped. So maybe I'll turn it around um, so now it's portrait shaped. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to place this photograph in the corner and I'm going to grab this T-square. Now you don't have to use a T-square, any straight line will do. You do have to make sure that that photograph is in the corner there. So what you're going to do then is place your straight line on the edge here, like I said, you can use a ruler if you don't have one with you. You can just use anything like the edge of a piece of printer paper. And you're gonna go corner to corner. So you're gonna go from this corner here, out of this corner here, and then you're going to draw a line. So you're gonna come down here. Sooner or later, you will hit the side of your paper. You may hit the paper on this side. You may hit the paper at the bottom. That doesn't matter, doesn't matter which one it is. But once you have hit the paper, then you can see that you need to cut this bit at the bottom off. So what I'll do then, and um, I would generally use a set square for this so that I know that it's level, but um, I haven't got one with me, so let's just do that there. Then you can see that that is the amount that you need to take off the bottom of your paper. Now, if you didn't want it as big as this, you can take any point along here and scale across from there. So we'll take a point here, for example, now again, I would need a, a square edge or a set square. I haven't got one with me, I'm just gonna do it by eye. But this tells you that then you need to go um, across here at a right angle, and you need to go up here at a right angle. And what you've done then, as I said, uh, forgive me if it's not dead level, what you've done then is you've made an area that has the exact same proportions as your photograph. If you want to go larger, you can pick another point down here, go up and go across. 
As I said, you can um, you can pick any point, or you can just take it to the maximum of your paper. Is um, what I would generally do. It works for any size or any shape. Maybe instead you've got a landscape. Let's turn it around the other way, and let's do the same thing again. So I'm going to take my straight line. I'm going to go from the corner to the corner here, and I'm going to take this straight out. So you can see this time I hit the paper much higher up. I would need to go across from here like this and now I have got a, uh, a piece of paper an area to work in that is exactly the same as the photograph itself and this is how you scale up your photograph so then you know if I'm saying to myself you know on this imaginary landscape well the horizons you know the horizons half a third of the way up and um, you know there's a tree in exactly in the middle here we are and do all of this. All of it is going to work out now. So you'll be able to scale up your picture really quite easily. And you can look at your photograph if we go back to the, uh, the portrait style one. You can think to yourself, you know, how high up the picture is this point here where the arch starts? You know, how far across uh, do we get this join between the two houses? You can say to yourself, it's halfway, it's a third, it's a quarter. And you can put that on your paper and you'll be not scientifically exact, but you'll be along the right lines. If you try and do that and you haven't checked that you're on the same proportions, what's going to happen is you are going to stretch and distort your photograph as you're scaling it up. As I said, with a simple landscape, you may just want to expand the sides or something like that. But if you're doing something a bit more complex involving buildings or perspective, I suggest you scale your photograph first by placing it in the corner and taking a straight line out of the edge. So the next mistake I have for you is using a load of black in sunset. So look at this photograph, it's very nice isn't it? Look at the foreground, it's all completely black. I'm going to put it down because um, it tends to block the other uh, microphone somewhat. Now it looks nice in a photograph because often photographs are quite shiny, sometimes they're under glass and they just have that kind of liveliness to them. I can assure you that if you do a painting, you may have tried this yourself, if you do a painting of a sunset, you do all of the foreground just, you know, completely flat black and the trees flat black, it's not going to work for you. It just doesn't look right. There is something about black and um, if you want to get into technical terms, black is a surface that's not reflecting much light and so it makes your painting look dull. This can depend on the medium, of course, but certainly in watercolours, I don't find it works very well at all. You really do need a little bit of something for the eye to look at, especially in a foreground. You don't want to have the whole, you know, front third of your landscape just being black paint. There's nothing for the viewer to look at. So what I do is a little bit of a trick. First of all, I tell myself I'm not going to use black. So I will use any dark color that relates to the colors I've already used in the landscape because the, uh, the landscape itself will be bathed in the same light as the sunset. So once you have a sunset, everything that you're looking at is bathed in those same colors. So I might use a, a very dark brown, I might use a navy blue, an indigo, I might use a burgundy, a deep purple, or a Payne's gray, anything to avoid using jet black. So that's the first trick to it. The second trick is to get that photograph, you know, even if it's from a book or something, put it on your computer and uh, scan it in or photograph it. And I want you to use your computer to, um, to lighten the light level. So most graphics programs, you can go in and you can just up the brightness. Now this may ruin the sky but that's okay, you can ignore that part of it, you're just looking at the foreground. What I have found, particularly with the photographs I've taken on my own camera, is once I up those light levels in the, uh, in the photograph itself, you can mess around with brightness and contrast, often you find that a lot of things appear, so you might find that there are little sort of um, houses and rooftops and just something to give a little bit of detail or interest. If it's a landscape you might find that bushes and pathways are just slightly visible, you want to make that foreground interesting. I'll put up one of my landscapes so you can see how I do it. And you'll see that it's just so much more interesting than going for this, uh, this flat black. It works in photographs. Don't think that it will automatically work for your painting. So the next mistake I see people make is um, in a landscape where you can see the horizon quite clearly, you know, perhaps a beach where you've got, you know, a long expanse of sea in the distance. What I see is curved horizons or worse still curved sea, which is uh, not a thing unless there's a wave involved or a whale perhaps breaching the surface. You can't have your horizon curving. The curve of the earth can only be seen from space. If the horizon is curving in your photograph, it's probably because the photographer used a wide angle lens and you're getting that fish eye effect, or they do even have 
things called fisheye lenses, don't they? So do be careful of that. Photographs often curve the horizon. It's not something that you should do yourself. The next mistake I have for you is white skies. So I've got a photograph here which has really been overexposed in the sky. Have a look at this. Now, can you see the shadows here? I point the shadows out because the, uh, the strong shadows are indicative of a sunny day. We can see from the photograph that it was a sunny day. So why on earth is the sky white? There are some clouds there for sure, but that doesn't explain why the whole sky is looking white. And this happens again and again in photographs, particularly on dull days. You'll find that the sky just washes out to white. If you're anything like me, you take everything on auto, that's okay, but you're gonna to have to adjust when you do your painting. So ask yourself, you know, was this a bright sunny day? If so, the sky would have been quite bright blue, at least in places. Even if there are clouds, no doubt you would see some cloud shadows and you would see some color. It's very, very rare, perhaps on a snowy day, it's very, very rare that the sky would appear white. So be really careful of this and um, ask yourself logically, if this was a sunny day, would the sky actually have been white. The next mistake I have for you is copyright infringement. This one causes so many arguments, particularly in my Facebook group. We have people come on and say, well, I found this photograph on Instagram, so I thought I'd paint it. Fantastic. You know, you can paint anything in the comfort of your own home. You can paint anything for study. You are allowed to do that. But once you start putting these things online, or worst of all, trying to sell them, you are on very, very shaky ground. You don't want to be copying anything that's um, you know, from a famous company. You certainly don't want to be copying superheroes or anything like that or any cartoon characters. As I said, you can do them for your own amusement, but actually in many countries it is illegal to put them online. Now, please don't start a load of arguments with me in the comments over this because the um, rules for this vary from country to country. But for me, I would just never be happy, you know, doing something that's not my own. There are so many websites where you can get copyright free photographs. I'll try and list some of them in the description of this video for you. I've also got some in my own Facebook group. We have a, a free copyright share on a Sunday and we put some of those in albums. You can come along and look at those albums and paint any of those photographs. As I said, there are so many places online that you can get fantastic photographs from. I know artists that uh, you know completely make a living, you know, ripping off Star Wars and things like this. Really, do they feel great about themselves? You know, do they you know, lay awake at night and wonder why people really buy their artwork? Is it because of their skill as an artist? I very much doubt it. So please don't infringe copyright. Please don't just take photographs you find online or in a book. I know I've spoke in this, uh, in this video about using uh, things from books, but I'm talking about using um, photographs where you take a small part or a small um, idea from that photograph, which is actually allowed. But there's very little that is allowed in copyright law. You know, you can't simply take a photograph and because you've done it in a different medium, you'll hear this misinformation all the time online. Oh, well, you know, it was a black and white photograph and um, I've made it a color painting, therefore I'm okay. I'm afraid you're not, you know, just don't uh, copyright, as I said, copyright infringement laws are so complicated and they're so variable uh, throughout the globe. Just don't go there, just don't do it. There is absolutely no need for it. You won't feel good about yourself. And um, you know, you might just be copying something for study, as I said, that's allowed. But what are you gonna do if it turns out really, really well, then someone asks to buy it. You just put yourself in that difficult situation of thinking, oh, shall I, shan't I? You know, and I used to do this myself when I started out something coming out better than I was expecting and then thinking, oh drat, I can't sell this, you know. So as I said, my advice to you is simply don't go there. So this next mistake is all about slavishly copying the photograph. And I see people sort of, you know, there'd be some horrible sort of color in a photograph and there's somebody in my class is trying to match it. And I think, why are you even trying to match that color? You know, it doesn't look very nice in the photograph. You know, the photograph itself might be quite dull. And you can find a photograph where, you know, all the colors are dull, it's not very interesting. You actually look at the structure of the photograph and you think, well, that could be something good actually. So don't be slavishly copying every part of the photograph. Of course, you want to get things like perspective so they look okay. But beyond there, you want to take that photograph and you want to really make it your own in terms of style, in terms of color. If you're saying to yourself, well, I don't really have a style, you do have a style, it's just, um, it's just developing and you haven't found it yet. And by just following your instincts, your natural style will develop. So I'm putting up some photographs as I'm talking 
of um, you know the original source photograph and what I made of it and you'll see that I do change things significantly. I like bright colours, I like sort of semi-abstract repeating patterns and these are things that I use in my paintings and particularly with things like backgrounds you know you really can make a photograph your own. What's the point of having this beautiful medium, um, you know, whichever medium you're working with, beautiful medium and all of the possibilities of that medium and then just trying to exactly slavishly copy the photograph. I was out walking once with uh, with my ex-boyfriend and we were walking by the seaside and there was some um, some beach huts on the left and we were both photographing and um, he said to me why, why are you photographing that view there's a bin in the front of it it looks terrible and I said it doesn't matter to me I'll just take it out when I do the uh, when I do the painting much easier than photoshop isn't it so him as a photographer he was looking at the overall um, elements and everything that was in the photograph but me I was just looking at well I like the shape of this I like the beach huts I can get rid of the dustbins later on. Of course, if you like dustbins, put them on. Who am I to tell you not to? But what I'm saying is that use your photograph as a starting point. Don't be slavishly copying it because otherwise, what's the point? If you want a copy of a photograph, you can just scan it into your computer and make a print, couldn't you? So I do advise you to really take a photograph and make the piece of art your own. So we talked about copyright earlier. Now, some of you may be asking, what about if I follow a tutorial online? And I see people ask this all the time. Um, if they're following some other artists' tutorials or following my tutorials, are you allowed to sell the artwork or even post it online? That all depends on the uh, the artist that's given you the tutorial. I would say certainly you'd be able to post it online because um, it's advertising for them. Whether you can sell the work or not depends on that particular artist. Some artists allow it, some don't. So I'm here to tell you right now that if you do any tutorial, one of my YouTube videos or from one of my online courses, I'm absolutely fine with you selling the results. I don't mind at all. In fact, I've got a brand new free mini course for you. So I've got a free rose tutorial. Why is it free, Michelle? Did I mention it was free? Why is it free? It's free just because I want to get my name out more. I want more people to experience my video tuition. All you have to do is go into the description of this video, click the link, make an account on Thinkific. That's free too. And then you'll be in and you can take the course. All I ask if you enjoy is that you share it with other people. And do let me know in the comments if you found this video useful and if you've made any of these mistakes yourself when working from photographs. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll probably enjoy it looking at my 10 most common drawing mistakes video. I'll put that one up so you can watch it right now.